Hi, I'm Eric Whitehead with Untamed Feast, and uh, I have a business in specialty dried wild mushrooms, and my dryer is behind me here. We're going to talk a little bit today about how to dry a wild mushroom, uh, what a buyer's looking for in a dried product, like what I'm looking for, how to keep it safe, and how to keep it valuable. Certain species of wild mushrooms are, can be quite valuable and sought after dried. Some of those are morels, porcini, um, lobster mushrooms. There, there's, there's many to choose from and some dry better uh, than others. A chanterelle mushroom, for example, is actually better fresh than it is dry, although there's still a market for some dried chanterelles. And they have to be done correctly and to a manner that's, that's clean and, and uh, looks like a very good product. Mushrooms like morels actually have a better value dried because their, their value holds very well and they stay uh, shelf stable. Now my, my specialty is mostly in dried gourmet species of wild mushrooms. These species are better dried than they are fresh for a number of reasons. One is a porcini mushroom, for example, or king boletus, boletus edulis. That mushroom is great fresh, but it has no shelf life. You never see it in a grocery store. It's highly perishable. It also has much more flavor if it's dried correctly. Um, it concentrates the flavor. Now some mushrooms, yes you're concentrating the flavor, but you're actually making a chewy, woody type of product. So there's an art in the drying, and once again, the species matters. Most species of mushrooms you're going to have to process and dry the same day they're harvested. There's some exceptions to the rule, but for bolites, uh, so that's porcini, red tops, uh, slippery jacks, anything like that, they have to be processed the same day. The minute you agitate that mushroom, these are, so these are the Boletus family, the, the larva, the flies, anything in them start moving. And uh, they can't sit, it's lost product. You have, to, you have to slice that up, you have to dry that as soon as possible, and uh, then go through your product and throw away anything that's not good. Morels, chanterelles especially, can be left in a fridge for up to four or five days that reduces their moisture content slowly and, and it's still a safe environment to hold them. But how this typically works for an operation like mine is you're going out, you're getting the mushrooms. You're either working with the harvesters or you're get a, getting them yourself. And then you're bringing them back to your dryer. And your dryer might be plugged in, so you have, uh, you have hydro power, or you might be running a generator to power it. Either way, the first step is you need an impeccably clean product. So you're, you're going to spend as much time cleaning these mushrooms as you are picking them. A dirty mushroom in a dryer, the dirt sticks to it, eventually somebody has to eat that and a piece of grit in somebody's mouth is unpleasant and it's a lost customer. So first step is they got to be cleaned really well. Then for some species they're sliced, okay, like these are porcini or king bolites. They're sliced at about a quarter inch. Then they're laid on the racks. These are already dry here and they have to have some space. You're working with a lot of air and a lot of heat, removing that moisture. Also the time of year really matters. Morels are in the spring and summer. It's much easier to dry a mushroom that time of year than it is in September, October in coastal BC. And the drier design will reflect that. A good morel, a good porcini usually takes 24 to 36 hours to dry. Now, if it's done in 10 hours, you baked it. It's done too fast, you're going to lose a lot of flavor. If it's done too long, as I said, productivity. So you're aiming around that. Typically, it's 24 hours in the spring and summer for species like uh, morels. And it's about 36 hours in the fall for species like porcini, uh, chanterelles. Now, the ambient humidity of the day changes that quite dramatically. The temperature in your unit, the type of firewood you're using, all that has an impact. But basically, those are the numbers you're looking for. As a source for fuel, wood heat is really important. There's a lot of dryers out there in the commercial industry. There's propane as a heat source. There's diesel. There's, uh, there's a variety of different methods. I feel, and most of the industry feels, that wood heat is the best way. It's the cleanest heat. It's the driest heat. It, it has a nice kind of mild fragrance if you have to open up the door once in a while. Um, and it's very safe. Also, dry pine is about the best fuel to use. Okay, so let's say you got your uh, dried mushrooms now, you've sorted through them, you've picked out the good ones, the bad ones, and uh, you've separated them. It's time to store them. So they've been finished at 50 degrees Celsius for a while, so there's no bugs or larvae in there that's gonna hatch. You need a food grade, uh, 
you need a container that pests can't get in. You can just use some Tupperware. They're pretty reasonable in price. And then spring for the food grade bags. They're not that expensive. Do not put your product into black garbage bags. It's really common. But what is unknown to most people is that they're perfumed. And that perfume on the inside of a garbage bag is actually toxic and it's not a food uh, safe product. So get yourself some food grade bags. In this case, these are dried morels. These came from Burns Lake, BC. There's also a, when this, we talk about how dry they should be, well, less than 8% residual moisture. 8 to 10 is okay. What happens if these are too, too dry, brittle, by the time these move around wherever they're going, it might be crumbs. If they're too wet, you don't have a stable product and it could go off on you. So there's a real fine line there and that is 8 to 10% residual moisture. Tie up your bag, keep it in a cool dry spot. They say that with all foods. That's what you want. You don't want these getting hot in here. You don't want them sitting by a sunny window, a heat register. Keep them downstairs in your cellar. Uh, locked up tight, no pests, no airflow, and check them once in a while. These basically you can sell morels up to a year later. Um, once you get beyond a year, there's two things that happen. That product is either getting better or it's getting worse. Dried mushrooms do age well or they go off and that's an art that you'll learn. There's much more flavor in an older mushroom if it's aged correctly. There's less flavor in a mushroom if it's not. It's also very important to keep your products separate always. So if you're picking a species of mushroom, that's what you're picking that day. That's all that goes into that bucket. That's all that goes into that dryer. And that's all that goes that's getting handled. The next day, if you want to move on to something else, fine. What that does is keep your product totally, totally allergen free. It's, it's rare, but there are people that are allergic to certain kinds of wild mushrooms. And if your dryer can't be pressure washed before you start a new round or a new cycle, you're, you're you're putting that person at risk. So always keep that in mind. One species at a time, an easy cleanable dryer. Now this particular dryer is hand built. Uh, hand built by me. It's a six by 10 utility trailer that's been converted. It runs off wood heat and it has a diesel generator option. Most of the time, if I can plug in, that's what I'll do. Even if I have to pay rent somewhere to, to station it, it's safer, you're plugged in, it's less of a fire hazard, and you have less drying cost. Your diesel is expensive. Now there's about $8,000 to $9,000 into this unit and that's not including my time. You can build something much smaller, you can do it a lot cheaper and I'm not saying my method is the only way to go. Keep in mind airflow and, uh, and good wood heat source. Uh, some other aspects here is, I mean, this thing's outside a lot. So make sure that it's, it's, it's weatherproof and you need some lights. You need some lighting inside and outside because chances are you picked mushrooms all day or you bought mushrooms all day or whatever you're up to and you have to process. And unless you're backing this thing beside a warehouse, you need, you need some lights in order to process, to slice, to grade, to manipulate your, your product. Um, also, this one is transportable. It's built into a, a trailer so you can move it around. Um, Many operations would just take a, a dryer that they can throw in the back of a pickup truck and assemble it on site. That is a much cheaper option. However, it has its limitations, which include you're building it on a ground surface. Uh, it's not mobile. It's a lot of investment and you don't quite know what you're getting into at the start of the harvest. Before you throw anything on the road, go and check with the Department of Transportation. Um, a utility trailer. Uh, obviously you can tow down the highway. Vehicles over a certain size, they have to go through scales. There's some things to consider before you just start slapping something together in the backyard and expecting to be able to tow it down the road. So before you put a lot of time and energy into this, do a little bit of research. You also may run into some troubles with insurance as far as uh, insuring a unit that has a stove inside it. Um, so just keep these things in, in mind, uh, write it all out before you invest your money. When it comes to building racks and screens, wood is definitely a good way to go. But if you can afford to get it done out of aluminum or stainless steel, by all means do it. It's, it's less moisture for your, for your machine to run through on every cycle.
The other thing is, as I mentioned before, the ability to power wash it. It's nothing to come in the front door with a power washer and just spray the whole thing out. That means electronics, wiring for tail lights, all that has to be moved to the exterior of the unit. That's really important. You will have, I guarantee you, about three months on a mushroom dryer if you use the stock wiring. Uh, the, there's moisture in there to a great degree every day and heat. Uh, surfaces that don't rust. You want to use uh, aluminum sheeting, whatever, things like that. You don't want rust around food. Common sense type things. So now th let's say, for example, you want to try this out. You're like, you know, I can build a pretty cheap mushroom dryer and, and uh, I got an abundance of mushrooms and I want to give this a shot. The first thing that's going to happen is uh, you're going to be sending a sample of your product to someone like me. So that's kind of where the beginning of the grading process starts for you and you get a yes no answer or this is this is garbage or this is great and you decide on a price from that or if you're putting them on wild trader or wherever you're selling them you'll figure that out with your with your client but the biggest thing as discussed before is it's got to be clean and it's got to be worm free and a good product that may be harder to do than it sounds make yourself up a food safety plan uh, this doesn't have to be a big deal it, uh, lay out how you're going to ensure that a this is a safe mushroom that you're harvesting or buying b how you're processing it that you're washing your hands that you have hand washing uh, uh, sinks on site and all the other aspects that make this a consumer friendly product now when it gets into uh, rules and regulations for this that does uh, some things you're going to have to figure out on your own or talk to the people in charge of that so with your food safety plan number one what are what am I drying? You know, um, if you're if you're already in the industry and you're thinking about drying mushrooms, obviously you know what kind they are. If you don't know what kind of mushrooms you're involved with, probably you you need to do a little bit of learning before you get into the business. For us uh, at Untamed Feast, every single product that is uh, harvested or purchased through us goes through my hands, and I'm a certified herbalist in BC. And there's a few other things in here as to how I mitigate any danger to the public. Um, if you're wholesaling this, it's, it's less of a risk. If you're shipping it to another company, they have to do their due diligence in what is this product. But, you know, um, in your safety plan, you should say how you know the difference and how this is working. So if you want to start drying some wild mushrooms and it sounds exciting, it sounds like a good time to you, and you're wondering, how do I get this initiated? There's a few things you can do. One is go to my website, untamedfeast.com, contact me, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Two is uh, you can go to wildtrader.ca and you can see what's being sold and what's being, um, what's being desired. But I'd be happy to, to help somebody talk about how they could get going and what needs to be harvested, what needs to be dried, what has value dried, what time of year, and see if it's feasible for you for the location you live in. And, uh, and that really makes a difference where you live in Canada. Uh, what mushrooms are growing there with what value. There's a lot of edible species, there's only a few that are incredible, and there's only a few of those that have any value. So knowing what uh, to look out for is really important.